Hey everyone, so welcome back. Okay, I'm Lil Dicha and then you're watching this on my YouTube channel. So today I'm going to talk about activity-based costing. So this is relevant to students who are taking this at the FIA level or the ACCA level. <clears throat> it's uh, quite elementary, it's more uh, meant as an introduction if you are doing this for the very first time. Okay, so the scope today is that we're going to look at a very quick revisit of what is absorption and marginal costing systems right and then we're going to look at what are the constraints and issues with the use of both costing systems right then next we'll look at uh, something very simple basically to understand the purpose of what is ABC right okay so that's pretty much about it and then we conclude with uh, what are some of the differences between absorption and the ABC costing system okay so what's the purpose of costing systems costing systems and or if not costing methods such as absorption marginal costing they are specifically developed for one purpose that is to help with the determining of the cost of goods right if you own a business one of the things that you need to know is what is the cost of the goods or services that you're selling because if you have no idea what is the cost that you want to, uh, of those goods that you want to produce, then how would you be able to set an appropriate price? Knowing the cost of the goods or services enables decision makers to make a judgment, a decision about what is the price that they wish to set, all right? And then therefore makes it possible for them to uh, achieve whatever desired profits, okay? At the same time, uh, it is important to note that failing to know the right cause will lead to certain problems such as incorrect pricing. Okay, because if you end up, you know, costing the goods too much, or if you end up having a cost that's too high, then that leads to a price that's too high as well. Okay, and this will surely affect competitiveness. What are, what if you happen to have, you know, not gotten a cost that's too low, right? Knowing that. If you, are, if you derive a cost that's too low, then it results in the other problem. It affects profitability. Right? No doubt, low cost results in lower prices. Yes, you do achieve revenues, faster revenue growth, but then there is the issue of profitability. Right? Having a cost that's too low will result in issues such as profitability and whether the business can be sustainable. Right. If the business is not profitable, then this will lead to issues such as sustainability issues, whether the business will continue to be viable, whether it continue to survive into the near future. Right. So which is why when you look at the topic of management counting, cost is a very key thing. Right. And it's not just a key thing in your studies, but it's also a key thing in business. Because by knowing what exactly is the cost of the product, it makes it possible to make various decisions like whether uh, the business would like to accept a special order or whether the business would like to accept uh, uh, the, uh, the opportunity to produce maybe a series of uh, a new line of goods, for instance. Okay, so generally the cost of a good or cost of the service is not very difficult to determine. Right, most of the cost of uh, goods and services should include at least materials, right? So if you're into a business of baking, for example, then materials could be like the baking powder, right? It could be including things such as sugar. If you are a motor car manufacturer, then this could include metal, wiring, and so on. Now, another key thing in product cost is labor, right? In most industries, especially where you look at something like, let's say, for example, baking again, Right, labor cost is a big component of cost. Right, let's say if you are operating a bank, then one of the key costs that is part of providing service is labor cost. Right, so it depends on what kind of business you're looking at. Okay. And finally is the production overheads. Production overheads make up a very key part of the cost of the product. Right, if you apply the absorption costing method then production cost is a portion of product costs right these three things 
make up the cost of the product or the service okay and then of course these why why is it that we refer to these three courses as being part of the cost of a product or service truth is that these courses have one very interesting characteristic they all can be readily traced to each unit of output like for example you know you're going to bake this cake for sale are you able to trace how much powder is being used how much sugar is being used are you able to trace how much time is required by your baker to finish baking the cake could you trace how much how many kilograms of powder could you trace how many kilograms of sugar is required to complete the cake yes you could so generally these courses are those that can be readily traced to each unit of output okay the same also applies for motor car are you able to trace material costs to the production of each car yes you could could you trace the number of man hours required to produce the car you could could you trace the amount of metal required to produce the car yes you could right so that's product cost okay or service cost now from the perspective of absorption costing each unit of output will have included a component of overheads absorbed into it right so therefore each unit of output if you were to apply the absorption costing method will include material labor and production overheads three things so the effects of using absorption costing methods are each unit tends to cost more okay that doesn't in any way mean that it's bad okay it means that each unit in has included whatever relevant cost within it now the valuation of the closing inventories will tend to be higher compared with the marginal costing method right if you remember the marginal costing method doesn't include any overheads it only includes direct costs which is only material and overhead production costs are treated as period costs are and are not part of inventory costs so the result is each unit of output if you were to apply the marginal costing method each unit will cost less and obviously it also means that the inventory on hand or the closing inventory would also be valued much lower compared to the absorption method okay so each method have their own uh, benefits as well as issues right which method to use okay now absorption costing gives one very powerful advantage that is overhead costs are fully accounted for in the cost of each unit this means that whatever price that is derived from the cost should cover all costs right the fact is that if you look at the long term revenue must be sufficient to cover all costs right there is no other way about it now marginal costing approach however ignores the production overheads right it leaves this out of the cost per unit or the cost of producing each unit right because the fact is that from the point of view of marginal costing overheads are irrelevant for purpose of short-term decision making especially for decisions such as make or buy or one-off special orders because in the short term the fact is overheads are generally unavoidable so which means that whichever you know uh, choice or decision being made whether to proceed to make or whether to proceed to buy overhead causes cannot be avoided at all so thus when we make short-term decisions generally uh, the thing is that we do not look at irrelevant causes like overheads right so that's where marginal costing is quite differently applied compared with absorption costing method the downside of course if you have uh, noticed is that marginal costing approach has one problem it has left out the production overheads out of the cost of each unit of output so potentially when you practice the marginal costing approach the cost per unit may be too low and may not be sustainable over the longer term right 
So, reality. Both methods will work well if, let's say, operations are quite simplified without complex processes, right? And if there are no great varieties of goods and services being offered, then absorption and marginal cost approach are perfectly fine, right? And it's even better if pixel base form a small portion of the overall production costs, right? Now, the unfortunate thing is that operations do involve many complex processes. If you think of the case of a motor car factory, how many processes are required to produce one motor car? How many processes? The answer is, there are quite a number. Painting, wiring, QC, and so on. Right, so it does involve many complex processes. Okay, so and in modern businesses, there is actually a wide variety of goods and services being offered. Right, there is no such thing as a business with only one line of product or only one type of product being sold. Right, so there are varieties. And fixed overheads in modern times make up a considerable portion of overall production costs. And direct costs have constantly been, been reducing in size compared to your fixed overheads. So compared with years back during the days of industrialization, during the days of industrialization, overheads make up a small portion of total production costs, whereas the direct costs make up the bulk of all production costs. That was back in the old days, the last time. Now in modern times, this has changed uh, quite a lot. Right. It is quite the opposite because much of the courses is made up of is made out of overheads and only a small portion is made out of direct courses. Alright. So uh, why is this the case? Because if you think of the modern motor car manufacturer uh, motor motor car manufacturers, a big part of the overheads include like maintenance, wiring, testing. IP support services. So this amount here can be quite considerable compared with years back during the days of the industrial like industrial revolution. So let's look at an example to see how we would apply the absorption costing method. If you remember, the Ford Motor Car Company was probably the first to have started assembly line production. Right? They started making cars over a hundred years back. And back then, they only made one uh, model of car, that was the T model. Right? If you read Wikipedia, there was only one model that was being produced uh, when they first started with mass production. Absorption costs would have fitted them perfectly because back then when Ford Motor Company first started uh, producing cars, there was no variety. And direct costs made up the bulk of production costs. If you remember what Henry Ford once said, Henry Ford once mentioned that you can have the car in any color you like, so long as it is in black. Okay, you got that. So there was no other variety. There was only one color and there was only one model. That's all to it. Right. So back then when Henry Ford, worked, you know, when he was uh, in the business of producing cars, absorption costing was perfect. Okay. So let's use <coughs> an example to illustrate how Henry Ford would have you know, determine the cost of producing each of his cars. Okay, say for instance, there is a certain motor car factory that incurs the following costs per month. There is the direct material, labor, overheads, total, 3,005. The factory produces 100 cars each month. And all these cars are exactly identical. And if you can add what Henry Ford has said before, black only. So what would be the cost of making each car? 3,005 divided by 100. Now why is it that we could do this calculation in this manner? Why is it that we could take the total cost and divide by number of cars? The reason is because all cars are exactly the same. The resources required to produce each car is exactly the same because there is no variety. They are exactly the same. 
So with this amount, then it makes it possible for Henry Ford to maybe add in a portion of profit and then he can determine what is the final selling price. Quite simple. No, wait. It is unrealistic for a car manufacturer to produce one model, especially, and I emphasize again, especially today. In today's global environment, a car manufacturer not only produces one model, right? Thinking about Toyota, thinking about Honda, BMW, and so on. Would they only produce one model? Obviously, they don't, right? The BMW have their own um, you know, 3 series, 5 series, 6, 7, and a whole wide range of models. And within that one model, like the 3 series, and the 3 series itself has many sub models, as you can see here. Right? There are many sub models and many variants, right? Variants for different countries, different regions, right? A single model can have many sub models and as well as various configurations, right? Some has better sound, some has uh, leather seats, some do not have leather seats, some have uh, finer interiors, some have more refined engines, for example. So there are so many variants. Right. It's completely different from the days when Henry Ford could tell people that you can have any you can have the car in any color you like so long as it is in black. Right. It is all different today. So how could you use absorption costing to determine the cost of producing a motor car? Right, could you do so? Right. Zoom back. Right. Well you could use absorption costing to determine the cost of making each car only if all cars that is being produced is identical right but the fact is that it is not true then can we use absorption costing to determine the cost of making each car the answer is absolutely no it is impossible right so what is very obvious now from uh, what i presented to you is that costing determining the cost of making each product has to be de has to be derived based on the resources used. Like for example, if the car doesn't have, uh, you know, isn't in, isn't painted in black, right? What if the car is painted in some uh, very unusual color? Let's say maybe stripe, right? Would uh, painting a car in stripe require more hours and more uh, resources? The answer is yes, right? So cost of making a product must be derived using the amount of resources used, right? In terms of, for example, labor hours, or maybe in terms of uh, the machines being used to produce the cars. So there is no way that two cars with different paintworks would cost the same, right? And what if this car came with leather seats, and this car had only fabric seats? Would they cost the same? The answer is obviously they won't be the same because to make leather seats and fabric seats, the cost is different. Right. And a product that requires more customization obviously should cost more than those that require little or no customization. Right. Just think about this. If this car had leather seats, strike thing work if there are any, right? And what happens if let's say this had uh bigger wheels okay so such additions to the vehicle means that there is more work and additional customization would eventually result in the car costing more right than those that didn't require any customization so motor manufacturers have been very uh, successful and in fact they are very quick and charging customers based on the amount of customization performed right so I'm sure you have heard of stories like, I mean, you have probably seen news where, you know, a car within a certain unique paint will, will tend to command a very big premium on top of the cost of the car. Right? There are many, BMW is one, Mercedes, right? You can probably imagine, you know, there are many manufacturers that will do the same, no? 
where you require something a bit unique, a bit unusual, you require customization, right? So therefore, the manufacturer will charge a premium, right? The consumer will have to pay additional premium to have all those customization done, right? And if you think of like manufacturers allowing consumers so much choice, do you think motor manufacturers will rely on absorption costing? No, they can't. Do you think that motor manufacturers will rely on marginal costing to determine the cost of producing that special car for the customer? The answer is no. These two are obviously insufficient, right? Especially for businesses like the motor car manufacturers, right? Because motor car manufacturers provide too much variety and provide too much choice to consumers, right? There is no way that you can apply uh, your usual absorption cost and marginal cost in the case of a motor manufacturer, right? It wouldn't be meaningful at all and it wouldn't be useful in any way, right? So therefore, ma motor manufacturers will tend to rely on activity-based costing because activity-based costing can overcome many of these issues faced by modern businesses. Because modern businesses can't depend on absorption much to costing, they need something more robust, something much more efficient in determining the cost of producing a good, and that is activity-based costing. Right. So aside from motor manufacturers, who else would have this problem with absorption and marginal costing? Businesses like, you know, architectural firms? Architectural firms will tend to, uh, you know, practice a bit of exhaustion costing, right? And people such as the accounting firms, right? Legal services, right? And so on, many others. So such businesses will tend to, you know, use a bit of activity-based costing because with activity-based costing, it is then possible to then, you know, determine the appropriate cost so that the business is able to determine what profit it desires and finally determine what price to charge the customer right and this cost can be calculated based on uh, the resources required right so if you're a motor manufacturer then the resources required may include painting hours uh, QC checks, quality control checks, uh, perhaps for example, amount of wiring work required, amount of uh, interior decoration work required. Okay, so activity-based costing allows businesses to do this, where they are able to exactly determine the resources required and enable them to determine the cost that is to be incurred in, in fulfilling customer order, and therefore finally dividing at the most appropriate price. To charge the customer all right so that is abc a very important uh, concept right and we'll be continuing with the calculation in part two of this video series right and then i hope that this has been informative i'm rodicia and you'll be watching this on my youtube channel thank you for watching